Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the wounds are still fresh on a big loss to the uh, Montreal Canadiens, 2-1. to one. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And before we get into things this week, I just want to shout out a guy on our team who not everybody sees and not everybody knows as well, but that's Peter Marino. Peter Marino is our producer. He's the guy that edits our show every week and makes it sound great. So, uh, Peter, you've been doing a lot of great work for us this season and for many seasons. Thank you for what you do for us. And um, Matt and I both appreciate it. So do all the listeners. Yeah, very much so. Uh we, our show would be a, a lot more difficult to produce if it was just Dan and I. Go back and, and listen to the first couple seasons when I did it. Yeah, so like, it, Peter does an amazing job. So thank you very much, Peter. And you know who else did an amazing job this week for the most part? The Calgary Flames. Let's take a look at their, uh, what they did. Uh, the Flames played four games this week. We're recording on Monday instead of Sunday as always. So we had... Uh, Ottawa, then three Montreal games. So let's go all the way back to the 19th, last Monday, when the Calgary Flames played the Ottawa Senators. And, Matt, I don't know what it is, but the Senators seem to be our kryptonite in this one. Um, we dropped a 4-2 game against the Senators. They had their third-string goaltender, or fourth-string goalie, I think, in net. Um, and we still couldn't beat them. Yeah, I don't know why the Flames take the Senators so casually. Oh, no, Matt Murray but... was in net. Sorry, my bad. I forgot. Yeah. Uh, at this point, is there really much difference? <laughs> but you know, anyhow, uh, you know what though? I, I, th- I think it's the story of the season, though, right? Like we we can't even beat the Senators. No, well, like if you look at the Flames' record, if they were even five hundred against Ottawa, which would still be bad considering it's Ottawa, the Flames are in a playoff spot by like two points right now. Well, and how many so, times earlier this year did you and I look at those Ottawa games? Say, so we'll get some points here, they'll get some points there, and they seem to have got you know very few of them yeah i think they've only beat them twice this year out of the eight games so yeah not not ideal and it's yeah it was and it's not like they're you know they're losing to ottawa by you know one goal or two goals like ottawa for the most part even if it's not shown on the scoreboard ottawa is playing great hockey against us and ottawa i think has looked like even the ones we'd won i'd say ottawa looked like the better team yeah, and this is one of those where effort level is indicative of the result. And Calgary, when we've played Ottawa throughout this season, have not shown up with any effort or intensity. And Ottawa's like, well, hey, we might not have a lot of high-end talent, but we're going to work hard. And, you know, that's the difference. The, a team that's way too casual versus a team that actually is trying, even though they're limited. Anything you really want to say about this game or just another Senators loss? Yeah, well, this is indicative of what the Flames' problem has been over the past few seasons, and like where they just play down to the level of the opponent or worse. And like, there's just no professionalism from this team. You know, like a professional team takes care of business and puts away the bad teams. And... It, that's why the Flames are not going to make the playoffs this year. You're going to lose to bad teams once in a while. I mean, you oh, look yeah, at the best sure. team, but it seems like the Flames learn learn nothing from their losses to Ottawa, and then they go out and make the same mistakes again. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, After the first three or four losses to Ottawa, you would figure that, oh, we should t- actually take these games seriously and treat it as if we're playing Winnipeg or Edmonton or Toronto. And, and instead, oh, Ottawa sucks. And we'll Matt, beat them. I'm with you, but it looks to me like Ottawa's pretty much played the same game every game they played. Oh yeah, us. like it. You know, they've got enough video. These guys have nothing but time on their hands this season. Sit and watch the video and learn what they're going to do, and you should be able to beat them more often. Yeah. Hey, skate and give an effort, and oh, hey, you won. That's all you have to do to beat Calgary. Well, after that game, the Flames had three days off. They took Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday off, and then uh, back in action on Friday against the Montreal Canadiens, who they've now played three times in four days. Uh, this was a big game for Calgary. They gained a little bit of ground on Montreal for the final playoff spot with a 4-2 to two win on uh, Friday against Montreal. This was an interesting game for both teams because both teams 
uh, ran with seven defensemen and 11 forwards. Nestorov was in and Buddy Robinson was out. We also thought this game might be canceled because uh, Josh Levo went on the COVID protocol before this game. So some interesting lineup juggling there at the last minute. Matt, can you remember a time we've seen the Flames run 11 forwards, seven defensemen? Well, you see, they're inching closer to my prophecy of turning one of those defensemen into a right winger. <laughs> They've, if we want a right winger, we got plenty of them. I know. Got to be silly there. Um, I thought in this game the Flames looked desperate, and that's where they have to be. They have to be desperate right now, and they didn't look desperate against Ottawa, but I thought in this game they looked like a desperate hockey team. Yeah, and this was more of like the level of hockey that, frankly, this team should have been playing the last month to get back into the playoff race. And like they were gifted an opportunity of three games against a team that you're down eight points to. And you have to win all three to draw within two. And, you know, for the first two games, they definitely showed that desperation and intensity to, hey, we might actually be able to salvage this. Yeah, you know, and when, when I looked at this... They clawed their way back. They definitely clawed their way back. And in this one, too, against the Canadians, I mean, the Flames never trailed, right? Well, they did trail after the Armia goal, but not for very long. And I would say they, well, they trade on the scoreboard. They never trailed in their play. Like, how often do we see them get down and they just get into a funk, right? Mm -hmm. We saw the Dubé goal, then Toffoli and Armia scored about a minute after Armia. Uh, Mangiapane tied it up. The second period, surprisingly, no goals. And then we had, Mon but the Flames still played well in that second. And Monaghan and Lindholm in the third to, you know, to take the lead. But I thought this looked like, if you're going to look at what the Flames might look like in the playoffs, this is the closest I think we've seen to what playoff Calgary Flames would need to look like to win anything. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, like, it's... This is why, I, like, I personally am so frustrated with this team because of the fact that you have this in you. You can actually play this way and be successful. Where is this all the time? Like, And I know you can't play this way all the time, but especially in situations where you need to get going, like the the game against Ottawa was inexcusable, and the previous losses early in the month were inexcusable. Matt, how often do you have a deadline at work or for something in your personal life, and you don't do anything and don't do anything and don't do anything until the week the deadline's in front of you, and then you do six weeks worth of work to because the deadline's staring you in the face. I kind of feel like that's the way the Flames are right now. It's like elimination is staring them in the face. Oh, now we better play good hockey. Yeah. And, you know, it, the Flames, uh, to their credit, like they did in the two first two Montreal games, did show up and do what they needed to do. And, like, if the Flames play like that more often, like moving forward into next season that uh, they're likely going to have a good bounce back year. It's just, you know, like, it also doesn't help that you have, like, Matthew Kachuk, he, he has been bad, basically, since that players-only meeting. And, you know, like, you can't just have one of your four key players just vanish on you. Well, let's dissect this team as we get near the end of the season, but let's finish yeah. looking at this week first. Uh, the Flames played the uh, Montreal Canadian again almost 24 hours later, and this was a Hockey Night in Canada game, and again a big win for the Flames, a 5-2 win here at the Dome over Montreal. Uh, we got goals in this one from Johnny Goudreau, Milan Lucic, Goudreau again, and Erasmus Anderson. Um, bad news in this one early on, I'd say a minute and a half in roughly. Noah Hannafin went down and left the game, and we've now learned that he will be, and we'll talk more about it in a bit, but we've learned that he will be out for the season with a shoulder injury. Um, Matt, I thought in this one, I actually thought that the Habs looked better in the first half of the first, and there's a game that Calgary had to sort of work their way back into, I thought. Yeah, and you you had to figure that Montreal was going to try to like throw everything in the kitchen sink at the Flames. Calgary just needed to weather that storm and then establish their game and go forward. And to their credit, they actually did manage to do that. And I always hate uh, 
injuries like Noah Hannafin's where it's a nothing play and he just kind of trips over himself after hitting the Montreal player and just awkwardly falls and injures his shoulder. It's just, uh, like, really? <laughs> if only know. we would have played with the seven defensemen in this game because we were down to five defense for the rest of the game pretty much right away. So you see a lot of guys getting more minutes than they usually would. Um, but overall, again, great play from the Calgary Flames, right? This is what we need to see if these guys are going to do anything. We need to see not only wins, but I would say complete efforts like what we saw in these two games. Yeah, well, like, that's why, like, last week when I said, like, if the Flames actually managed to make the postseason, that they'd be a tough team to play against because, like, in order to get there, they'd have to be playing basically this type of game consistently. And, you know, if you're on a roll, like, winning 13 or 14 of the 16 games that you needed to do, then, you know, you're going to be running on full cylinders and you might just run roughshod over whomever you play in the first round as they're trying to get their game going up to speed to match you and you know that's part of why like today's result was rather disappointing well let's move on to that so the flames uh played that saturday game got the big uh 5-2 win and then they had sunday off and today's monday and we're recording just minutes after the game and the calgary flames end up losing two to one to montreal to finish out the uh, the season, well, not yeah. I think the whole se- season series is done, right? We're done with Montreal now. Yeah, yeah, we are. So to finish out the nine game season series uh, with a two to one loss against Montreal in this one, Matt, I'll give you my quick synopsis. I thought that the Flames uh, got themselves in some penalty trouble early, which is what got them down, and I thought they played well until the second period when the Toffoli goal happened, and after that, it just felt like the wheels started to come off. Yeah, well, like, take the last four minutes of the game, and, like, that was as big of a tire fire as I've seen any team who's trying to actually navigate some sort of offensive push. Like, I am bewildered that Montreal did not manage to score on multiple occasions on the empty net, because, like, that was just an embarrassment, frankly. Um, uh, I do not understand the like light your hair on fire level panic that the team like there's nobody on the team actually just saying okay breathe calm down go out there just have a good shift you know like there's nobody on the team that's actually you know and they're just running and running and running and running trying to make the perfect plays and and it felt oh, like it felt like the last four minutes, maybe in the last six minutes, it just felt like they were reverting to what they've done in the past. Yeah, exactly. And like there was no calm. Like it, you, you take like any of the teams that have been successful, and like when they're in a pressure situation like this, where they need to win or get the equalizer, there's always a calmness. Like okay, yeah, we're losing. But we're just going to keep throwing everything at you and throwing everything at you, making simple, effective plays, keep making small, easy passes, no rush until the play unfolds, and if you turn it over, you reset, you keep coming, though. But the Flames, it was like, oh, I got the puck on my stick, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? And, like, it it just burned the whole six minutes, and... They were the they has, were trying did, to make the perfect play, not just make a play. It felt like, didn't it? Yeah, and like you saw, like Manjapane and uh, Backland and a handful of other guys, like breaking in one on three, just trying to make some sort of play to enter the zone. It felt like when everybody it, wanted to be the hero and get the big win for the team instead of work together as a team to get the big win for the team. Yeah, and. You know, it's like, why are you swinging for a grand slam when all you need is a base hit? Like, and, like, the, this team, you know, like, they have learned a lot of lessons, like, especially over the past couple of games, of how to play more of a proper style of game. But, you know, like, this level of just freak out panic that this team has faced like we saw that that was the reason why the flames lost to colorado 
because they, they just never reset themselves. As soon as Colorado got any momentum, they just this <laughs> for the four, last four games. And when Dallas scored, when we were up three, you're talking about in, playoff series now, just for context. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when we played Dallas last year, we got up three nothing. Once Dallas scored, it was the same. Oh, panic! And then seven goals later, <laughs> and you know, like this team needs to learn how to com- have composure when facing adversity, and grow up. That like you are going to occasionally be in bad spots. And it's not the end of the world that you're in a bad spot. You just have to do things and approach it calmly and just do the simple things. Well, this to me comes back to what you and I have talked about this season, which is they need to play 60 minutes, right? And we saw that they played, I'd say, the majority of this game well. But those last, yeah. I'd even get more than um, more than four yeah. minutes. I'd say maybe the last eight minutes. They started reverting to old habits. They started not playing well. Like they just, It's like they, you know, they, they just can't finish. They just can't. Like you said, they're not calm. They can't finish some of those. Um, so they can't finish the game and get what they need out of it. Yeah, which it, it's really strange, like because of how like this team was previously, where like I, like I'm remembering the Halloween game against Nashville, where they were just relentless and they were down four nothing heading into the third period. And just kept relentlessly putting pressure, and they ended up tying the game and then winning it in overtime. And, like, I don't know why in certain situations, like, they can be effective like that. And yet, when the the pressure is elevated a bit, that it just, like, even the basics of hockey sense just vanish from the team. And, like, everybody's gripping the sticks too hard. And, like, even just simple things, like a pass from the four... Like, Gaudreau, he had plenty of time at one point to pass it to Giordano at the point. There was no pressure, and yet he missed him by, like, four feet. And the puck went all the way down the ice. And it's like, you had time, there was no pressure on you, Giordano's standing all by himself... Why are you like airmailing that pass down the ice? Like it This game alone kind of sums up the Flames season, which is they have the potential, they have all the right guys, but they can't finish. Yeah. It, it's the most perplexing team I've ever seen. <laughs> One guy I do want to give credit for this week is Sean Monahan. I don't know if it was just with yeah. a difference in line mates or what's going on there, but he seems like a totally different player and sort of you know what we've been talking about is if if this Sean Monahan was here all year, we wouldn't be having some of the problems we we're having. But it just seems like Monahan's. I don't know what's changed in the last couple of weeks, but this week especially, I really noticed him doing the right things. Yeah, and you know, like it's similar. Like if the Flames had Kachuk playing even remotely like Matthew Kachuk, they wouldn't be in this spot. If Monahan had been playing like Monahan, they wouldn't be in this spot. And, like, frankly, like, everything has gone wrong, and, like, up until today, they had a a really good chance of still making the playoffs. And, you know, like, it's like, if you guys had actually got out of your own way, whatever the problems are, like, it's just so frustrating, because, like, this team, you see flashes of it, and it's so, like, oh... You know, you can believe in them that, oh, they might do it because you can see it. And then a game like this happens where, like, all you needed to do, like, you're playing Montreal's backup. They've played three games in four nights, four games in six nights. They're even more tired than you are. And you can't find that extra gear to elevate yourself to get more than one goal it's the calgary flames man true it's just frustrating and disappointing well with that let's look at where we are in the scotia north standings uh flames have played 48 games which means they have eight remaining at this point they're 21 24 and 3 with 45 points uh and a 0.469 save uh win percentage or i guess points percentage so if we look at where that puts us that puts still toronto first winnipeg second uh edmonton third 
Montreal's at 51 points. We're at 45. Vancouver right below us at 41. So, I mean, we've got eight games left. Um, I don't I don't think we make it. But, Matt, what are, what are, what are the scenarios in which the Flames can still make the playoffs? Well, you have to look at Montreal's schedule. They have nine games remaining. And basically all of their opponents, they have one game against Ottawa, and then the other eight are against Toronto, Winnipeg, and Edmonton. It's funny, because you say they have one against Ottawa, so they're going to win that. And I look at our schedule and go, thank goodness we have none against Ottawa. Uh, we do. Oh, that's we right. Have one. We do. We have one. You're right. I'm, I'm looking ahead yeah. here. Yeah. So, you know, so like it, at Montreal, like they, they've been struggling mightily lately. And now like eight of their last nine games are against the playoff teams. So they're going to have to give like a full effort to beat those teams. Now, so like the points, like even though they have a six point lead, points are going to be tough for Montreal moving forward. Vancouver has basically the exact same schedule as Montreal. They have the four games that against us, but like they're playing a ton of hockey. They're like every day, every other day, like all the way through to the end. So like they're and almost all of their games are against uh, Toronto, uh, Winnipeg, and Edmonton. And just for those that don't know, uh, the schedule has been revamped because of Vancouver's COVID issues. So we will play them on the 13th, the 16th, the 18th, and the 19th of May. Yeah, and, and like if you look at the Flames schedule, like the early part of May is rather bare. We have a game on the 1st of... against Edmonton, not again until the 5th, and then not again until the 9th. Yeah, and you would think, oh, well, that's perfect spots for some of those Vancouver games to get moved up and no it isn't because Vancouver is basically playing that entire week like they have like two days off <laughs> it's yeah it's really bad for Vancouver uh so like they are in a similar spot as Montreal where they have to both play a lot but all pretty much against the good teams so like points are going to be difficult uh, they have one game against Ottawa, which is their next game, and then every other game is against the playoff teams, and then the four against us. So, on that note, um, it will be difficult for Vancouver to overcome their deficit to leapfrog Calgary or Montreal. But looking at this schedule, Matt, I mean, let's be realistic here. It's going to be realistic for the Flames to pick up points. It Well, that's where... If Calgary does their job, like they have two against Edmonton, one against Winnipeg, one against Ottawa, and four against Vancouver, those, you know, it's going to be tough. Like, you know, like frankly, the Flames are going to need to go 6 1 and 1 at a minimum. And I worry about the start and stop. I really do. Having three games or four games between some of these, I worry that just the start and stop is going to throw these guys off. Yeah, and so Calgary, all they can control is what they do. And they need to win against Edmonton. They need to win against Edmonton again. And just keep getting points. So 6-1-1, and and so matter. you can lose to Ottawa and then lose, what, one of your games to Vancouver? Yeah, in overtime. <laughs> Because you know that the the loss against Ottawa is coming, you can just pencil that. Well, that's one it. In. Let's let's pencil that one in already. But you know, Calgary, like, and it's not going to be easy. Like, it's going to be ridiculously tough. And like, that's where, like, getting two points today was imperative because then they could go say five and three and make it. And being realistic, they could have done the five and three and made it but now it's you pretty much need to be perfect and so calgary basically until they meet up against vancouver on the 13th they need to win everything and that's going to be tough they they have to beat edmonton twice winnipeg once and ottawa once so six and, one and one is your magic number yeah at a minimum all right, and, so, so let me ask you this then. Realistically, based on what we've seen from the Calgary Flames here, not what's on paper, not what the potential of this team is, based on what we've seen, 
Do they do six one and one? I think that the odds of them hitting six one and one uh, and making the playoffs are probably in the neighborhood of about two percent. So you're not going to take money to Vegas and bet on the Flames in the playoffs. I might might throw a dollar bet to you know just because. So you're throwing a buck but, Americans. You're spending what three dollars Canadian on that bet. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, I I think Matt, we're done. Like, yes, it's we're not mathematically out, but realistically, I mean, yeah, we're, the, we're the longest done. win streak like, we've had is three. So that means we need what two three game win streaks at this point, and we lose one between them. Yeah, it's gonna be tough. Like, I I'm not arguing or debating. Like, you know, like they're going if they want to make the playoffs. This is what you need to do, and. It is doable, and they are going to need help. But you know, it, I just feel like between they, us getting our business done and Winnipeg or um, Vancouver getting their business done, and you know the Canadians and all the chips falling exactly the right way, it doesn't happen. Oh, I would be absolutely shocked. I would be pleasantly shocked. But I would be absolutely shocked if the Flames make the postseason. I don't know. I, I I probably shouldn't say this, but I don't even think I would be pleasantly shocked. Like I think the I think uh, my worries if we make the playoffs, management looks at it and says, "Wow, we did it. This core managed to do it. Let's keep them together." I think we almost need to shock the system at this point, not make the playoffs, be in the draft lottery, move players out. Like I think the right thing, what the doctor ordered this year, is not being in the playoffs. Yeah, uh, like, frankly, I think some of the older guard players on this team need to cycle and out. And I think part of the reason they haven't already is because we've made the playoffs in some years, or maybe we shouldn't. And so it's like, well, this roster's getting it done. Let's keep them together. Yeah. No, and, like, I've mentioned it before, but, you know, like, when it comes to the expansion draft, I would leave Giordano exposed. You know, and it's not because of him, but, you know, he makes six and a half million dollars, and, you know, you can spend that elsewhere. And, you know, like... There's lots of money we can get rid of, but we'll talk about that when we get closer to it. Oh, I know. You know, and I think that, you know, with the Flames where they are, looking at these games, I mean, we, we struggle against Ottawa. We haven't done great against Edmonton this year. I can't even remember the last time we played Winnipeg. Like, it seems like it's been... A while now. Like, we played them a ton at the beginning. Yeah, it's been like two months. It's been it March twenty like. ninth was the last game, so just over a month. Um, yeah. which is weird because we played them like you know one two three I think four times in the first month of the season. Um, yeah, it's it's just weird how they put those together, and I think that you know. At, the nice thing about this, and you and I had a little bit of discussion at the beginning of or before we started recording. If the Flames are going to do this, they have to ride Markstrom. We only have one back-to-back from here on out. And that's good if you're trying to ride one goaltender, right? And that's the very last two games of the season. So I think if you are going to try and make this run, at least you know that with three days rest between most of these games, you can keep your goalie in top shape. And I think we'd both agree that if they're going to do this, it's because Markstrom's in top form. Yeah, exactly. Markstrom's playing every game until... Until they're out. It's, yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, I look at this, I've thought for a while, I mean, we did our eulogy on the show a couple weeks ago, this team, while there's some glimmers of hope, this is done. I mean, we're going to play out the rest of the season. I wouldn't be surprised, Matt, if we're eliminated, if we don't play those four Vancouver games. I w- at this point, I'd be surprised if they played more than two of them. Yeah, I mean, if and and I haven't seen, I haven't really watched Vancouver since they came back, but I can imagine they're not up to you know speed where they want to be. Well, and they lost to Ottawa today. I know so, they lost, you know. yeah, but I haven't <laughs> I haven't seen them play with my own eyes. I know. And knowing how you know our cases, knowing how, and I don't want to get into a big COVID discussion, but knowing how our cases are growing here in Alberta and that Levo's had you know already COVID exposure. I'll be honest, I'd be surprised if the Flames don't get hit by it too in the next month here. Calgary just needs to focus on the job that they can and whatever happens happens and yeah, like I you know, like I, I would be hopeful that like uh Monahan and Kachuk 
bounce back, at least for the last eight games. But we'll see. Like, you know, uh, it's showing a lot of interesting things. Like, uh, I'm surprised at how good Gaudreau has been. Yeah. And, and, yeah, he's he's looked good, and I think I'm also surprised how much we've tried him. Well, not how much, but how much production we've got from him when he's been away from Monaghan. Because those two have kind of been joined at the hip for how many seasons? And we saw them split up a little bit this season, and they did well. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing them back together, and they're doing well. But I I think that the, you know, we'll we'll talk about it more when we recap our season. But I think if you're going to keep both those guys – the the way to go is splitting them up yeah and i think that like if the flames are going to keep because like it that's where like if the flames do decide to like retool a bit and say move out a uh giordano at the expansion draft just to go with that thought experiment and the the six million dollars that would be freed up with uh riddick uh bennett and uh derek ryan moving on at eight million pardon me like that's 15 million dollars the flames can go and sign a right winger and another middle pairing defenseman and like promote hannafin to the top pair and you know like find like another tanev type guy and balance the team that way and try to get like a legitimate top six right winger and you know move on and see what's next and like can Manjapane and Dubé take that next step next year if they're going to keep Monahan and uh, Gaudreau and you know honestly I'm still torn with whether or not that would be actually a better idea just to ride it out and see it until like they're in their final year of their contract well next year's Gaudreau's final year right yeah well, like, write it out and see at the deadline, basically. The only downside to that is if you're in, you're going to keep them. And I guess the question is, is there value there? And can you replace that value? Well, frankly, I think that, like, if uh, the team bounces back next season and plays more like the last few, well, basically, like, how the Flames played in 3 4 under Daryl in the regular season versus the 0203 version, which was kind of wishy washy. You know, like if they bounce back and like are playing that effective way from game one, I, I think that Goodrow would be staying and you would sign him to a longer term contract. To me, I think the big question there is does Kachuk bounce back and is Kachuk your number one or your number two left winger? Because right now he's sort of the number two. If he looks the way that we all think he was progressing, and everybody has a bad season. I mean, yes, we've talked about him having a bad season this year. We understand it wasn't great. But what happens next year? If he's looking good and he's your number one, I think you move on from Goudreau. Well, also, like, there's the idea of using Kachuk on the off wing. And, you know. But but uh, my worry there is they move Kachuk to the off wing and go, we've solved our right wing problem, which we really haven't. No. I know. It, it's one of those where... I mean, like, the easy thing to do is move Kachuk to the off wing, move Lindholm to center, you go, wow, we have a deeper team, but we just mask our holes. Oh, for sure. And, like, I think that realistically the only way that this team, like, outside of band-aids by, like, free agent right winger signings, um, like, you're only going to address that really by trade. Or by drafting the guy and like that's why like if the flames are drafting i'm sure that they've got their eyes on dylan gunther who's a right winger that is in the ballpark of where, where they're going to be picking if things stay roughly the same uh but you know it, it's one of those situations where this team they they just have to it, it's like last off season where the the two glaring weaknesses they needed a goaltender that was an actual starting goaltender and to change out some of the defense pieces well Treliving got the goaltender got Tanev and you know nibbled around the edges on everything else he you know it's hard for him to anticipate two of the four 
top four forwards vanishing for most of the year. And that really none of the forwards he brought in would do anything. Yeah. And, like, we've seen s- solid, steady progression from Dylan Dubé and Andrew Mangiapane where they're looking like top nine forwards that are actually good. Well, even today's game, Mangiapane got top line right wing minutes with Goudreau Monahan. Yeah, and he looked good. And, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if he becomes a top line right winger in the NHL. But again, we got to like be careful because I don't guy. want us to go, well, we've got that problem solved. No. Oh, no. It, it, that's where, like, the Flames will have to navigate, like, sh- shifting around some cash to free up money to go and get a big fish right winger to, like, a legit it, of the same class as Lindholm, Monaghan, Kachuk, Gaudreau on the right side and then hope that Munjapane and Dubé actually continue their progression upwards so, so that way you're getting like seven or eight good forwards instead of just four that you're relying on so if we're going to have this discussion um, so Goudreau, Monaghan sort of have been our number one pair let's assume that Kachuk bounces back because he's young and everybody has an off season um, well you also have to remember like he did have that concussion in the playoffs last year and concussions always for young players tend to mm-hmm. screw them up for a bit so it could partially be that it could be a whole litany of factors yeah really. we, we have so, no idea we haven't been around the team we i don't want to speculate on hearsay or what we've heard because we have no idea yeah but let's i mean he's not the only guy let's be fair it's not like no. a chuck's the only guy who's not performing but no. let's assume that everyone's performing the way we expect them to next year so your first line is goudreau monahan and some right winger we bring in yeah. Your second line then, do you put Lindholm at right or at center? Center. So then your second line is Kachuk, Lindholm. Do you bring in another right winger or does Mangiapane go there? Eat, eat bread. Um, and then your third line is Lucic, Backlund, Dubé? Yep. And fourth line is whoever else we've got money for? Insert name of random kids here. <laughs> so, I mean, that gives us really two really solid lines. However, I don't know that we have – I don't know I'm still that confident in that right wing. I think we need to go out and get a bona fide top, th- top line right wing and a, a guy who has a proven 2-3 record, kind of a 25-30 goal guy um, to, f- to fill those spots. If it was, well, if it was you know, me, like I said, I would try to trade Johnny for a right winger and then move Mangiapane on to second line left. Yeah, it, you know, alternatively – you know, because, like, I'm assuming that insert first-line right-winger here guy is going to be about a $5.5, 6000000 million player, not a, like, 7 or 8 If you're freeing up, like, Giordano's money and the $8 million that you've already cleared by letting, uh, getting rid of Bennett and Riddick and Derek Ryan, um, you would... Uh, the third line I would kind of actually assume would be like left wing being Dylan Dubé, Backlund at center, and then like uh, another top nine ish right winger. Not a higher profile guy, but like a solid. It's almost, it, I mean, not this guy because it's too old, but the Justin Williams type, the veteran guy yeah, who's been around exactly. the league forever. Somebody and can, that, yeah, somebody that's competent and like can be a 30 point guy mm-hmm. that just does his job and is not useless. Yeah. Yeah, like basically what Tri- Troy Brower was supposed to be, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And looking around the league, there's a few of those guys that'll be available. Um, yeah. And I mean, even if you look at it, even if it's not a, an older guy, Josh Levo should have been that guy, right? A guy who's been around yeah. for the league for a while, a guy who's, you know, done he's done a little bit of everything. He's played offense. He's played on, you know, special teams. He's been kind of the two way guy. Um, uh, you know, I mean, looking at the, looking at the list here, if you want to go cheap, you could even try to get Bobby Ryan in that role for one year. That actually, oddly enough, was the, the player I was specifically thinking of. So yeah. And you know, like there are plenty of guys that are in that generic mold. And like, even if you were to trade for one of them, there are a handful of teams that have that surplus-ish guy, and it wouldn't be more than like a third or fourth round pick. So let me ask so. you this then. Let's assume that Goudreau gets moved. 
Is Monahan still your number one center then, or is Lindholm no. become your number one center? No, um, Lindholm would be. So would you then do Lindholm? So you'd have Lindholm, Kachuk, and whoever the new right winger is. Yeah. Monjapani, Monahan, Dubé, and Dubé. You stay with those three. Yeah. Uh, basically, in that scenario, um, because Eatbread and uh, Dubé are both fast relative to Monaghan that you kind of want Monaghan to be basically the defensive guy on that line and let the wingers do the thing and you know with Monaghan hanging back a little bit and because those two are faster let them rip and yeah at that point though and you and I've had this discussion before does Michael Backlund seem like a very expensive option for your 3C? No, absolutely not. You don't think so? Michael Backlund, to me, is probably the most important player on the team as from the forward group because he is just that good defensively that you can't really replace that. And like he, even though he's had a bad for Michael Backlund season, he's still one of the top 10 defensive forwards in the league. I can see many scenarios, though, where he doesn't get protected. I would be absolutely floored if they left him unprotected. So who are your seven protected forwards? Uh, Goudreau, Monaghan, Kachuk, uh, Lindholm, uh, Manjapane, Dubé, and Backlund. Okay. Because Lucic said he was going to wave. Yeah. So. Yeah, it makes sense. And I don't see Seattle taking Lucic no. anyway. So I, I think that's why he waved because, yeah, nobody's going to take that. So... Um, that's why, like, I'm assuming on defense that uh, the three would be Hannafin, Tanev, and Anderson. That well, let's talk about Hannafin for a minute, because we haven't gone there yet. Hannafin, now injured, got a shoulder injury, out for the rest of the season. Um, we saw some big shuffles in this game tonight. Well, hey, one sec. If the Flames make the conference finals, he will be back. Flames aren't making the conference <laughs> finals, man. <laughs> you never know. It might not be a season-ending injury. Yeah, oh. it's a season-ending injury. But <laughs> um, so you look at you look at the pairings. Giordano and Tanev have been playing together for a while. I'd said at the beginning of the season these are the guys I'd put together. Second pairing: Yusuf Valamaki and Michael Stone. And there's a guy who's played his way into the top four. Like this is a guy yeah, who uh, didn't play at all, has played great since he came back. And honestly, his way I think the that four. the best thing for Michael Stone was the time off. Because he, I think he was just battling a whole mess of injuries and just ha having the time to let his body recuperate. Because honestly, since he's been back in the lineup, this is the best Michael Stone we've seen mm -hmm. of him in a Flames jersey. And he's looking more like the Arizona version that well, where I was going to say, this is the guy who earned the multi million dollar contract. Yeah. And it's like, uh, can we have you back? <laughs> you know, and you just keep doing this and aces you know like well and this is where i can see them letting go of nestrov and keeping stone next year oh yeah definitely and like honestly it, it, i would definitely like get a million and a half for a stone at this rate like if he's gonna play like this you know being a number six like that would be but at the same time he hasn't proven perfect. he can keep doing it no, i'd, I'd give him one more year one -year less deal. than a million yeah. and then say uh, prove it and we'll give it to you i would a uh, one and a half as a because he's played that well that he's showing the potential of be you know earning that three million dollar ish contract. We also gave again. money to walk away. He's got enough of our money. Yeah, how would you say it's in this particular case? It's more about loyalty to the guy because he has, you know, they he didn't have to sign back here, and like the Flames invested in him, and you know, and he's bounced back. I think the Flames you know giving him a little bit more than might be necessary might you know if he does have a good season next year you're more likely to keep him for like another two or three years after that where if you cheap out he's like yeah well i got mine now bye and <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. I mean, he his wife's from Calgary. I think he wants to stick around here. You and I'll disagree. We'll agree to disagree on this one. I think with the cap crunch win, I wouldn't go more than yeah. a million on him. We've given this guy. Enough. I want to see him stay around, but I don't think we pay him for a loyalty at this point when he's looked good for less than half a season. Pay him less than a million, make him prove it, and then talk about you know bringing him back and paying him more. 
Yeah. But, um, you know, like, uh, frankly, with Hannafin going down, like, the Flames, like, having Stone playing as good as he has been has been a huge boost to the team. The big shock to me here, uh, Rasmus Anderson moved to the third pairing with Nikita Nesterov, and we did hear Daryl Sutter this morning talk about the loss of Hannafin and how he said that a lot of his young defensemen haven't looked great this year, and that's a guy you can't replace. And we even saw Yusuf Alamaki as a healthy scratch, um, you know, for some games this year. So I think that really, I mean, and we have to remember, Valimaki hasn't played a whole season in a while. He's been hurt for a while. This is his first full season, I think, since he turned pro. But I think it's fair to say that Valimaki and Anderson probably haven't had the seasons we wanted. And again, not just these guys. We just talked about a whole litany of forwards who didn't either. Oh, yeah. No. How would you say uh, Anderson has looked like an adequate number four and Valimaki an adequate number six for this season? They were expected to be a number two and a number five, but they didn't quite match up to that level of expectation. But it's not like they've been completely horrendous. It's just they needed them to be more than what they were. Is it the end of the world? No, because they're still good enough. Well, but, and when the rest of the season, it, it, when the rest of the team is not done well, the season not as though these guys are bringing us down. They're they've looked poor like everybody else, and we just need them to bounce back at the same time as everybody else next season. Yeah, exactly. And like these guys are all young. Like Hannafin's twenty four, Anderson's twenty four, Valimaki's twenty one. I think just turned twenty two. Like these guys are all really young, and you know, young defensemen usually don't get their sea legs until they're 26 so where like that you're getting like the full product from them so yeah it's frustrating but like you're seeing enough progression in anderson's game that you know that he's going to be a top four defenseman and i think the big story on defense has been hannafin i mean he's yeah. he's looked better than he has i'd say as a flame my big worry now, though, is there's some guys that get a big injury and they never come back. And to me, he's too valuable and too young to be spoiled already. So I'm really hoping he makes a full recovery. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think that that injury was severe enough where... Like, how would you say? Like, it, it being a shoulder injury, like, that would affect his shot more than anything. And it's not like he's scoring a ton of goals anyway, so... You know, like, it might impact it, but I don't think that, like, it. it's not like he's, like, a Shea Weber or Dion no, Phaneuf. and I think you could easily transition him in that case to be more of a defensive defenseman. Yeah, exactly. A playmaking... TJ Brody, basically. Yeah, and that's a guy that I think next year it's going to be really interesting. I think more than the forwards, I think the shift on defense is going to be interesting next year. I think we'll see. I think they're going to want to try Hannafin Anderson as our top pair, and then uh, yeah. Tanev uh, Valimaki is two, and I think the Geo could even fall as a third pair if he's here. Yeah. Well, what I'm kind of assuming with, because uh, I'm assuming that Giordano goes, uh, is that uh, the top pairing will be Hannafin and Tanev, because just for the they veteran look good this guy, year. new left pairing defenseman, Tanev ish type, you know, insert whomever is appropriate. And you think that's a four, UFA? Yeah, like a four or five million dollar guy. You know, a decent solid number three. Put him with Anderson and keep Valimaki and Stone as your third pairing. You don't need to rush Valimaki up, and, like, that's why I think, like, getting insert name of veteran guy here for two years, you know, allows Valley to develop fully, because I'm assuming that, like, Valimaki is going to be a top four defenseman, just like Anderson and Hannafin, for, like, the next decade for this team. So, like, I'm kind of expecting those three to emerge as the guys for this team. So you're kind of thinking you bring in a guy, maybe three, maybe overpay him a little bit to get the veteran presence. By the time yeah. his deal's off the books, then it's really time to re-sign Valimaki to probably yeah. that guy's money. Exactly. Just like how Anderson got Brody's money. Uh, you know, and I think that, like, 
as like the deal progresses like that's why i was saying two years more than three but you know if you it requires three great then you just swap valimaki with said veteran guy and make the veteran guy the third pairing and you know spread the wealth around and then on that third pair with valimaki michael stone yep that's why i wouldn't mind you know giving him an extra little bit just because if this is what he brings like over a full season like but again we don't have yeah we don't have a lot of evidence though since he left phoenix that that's what he brings I know. Well, I'm basing it off of, hey, he's healthy for once uh, after, you know, basically not playing hockey for a year and a half, and he's playing at that higher level, and, you know, if he continues through the rest of the regular season, you know, because if, say, Valimaki and Stone are your third pairing, like, that's a hell of a good third pairing, if this is the Michael Stone that you're getting. So, yeah, I think I'd probably only do at that point Stone for one or two years. Yeah, it would be a one-year deal because I think that it, both the team and Stone would want the flexibility. Because like if Stone sucks next year, then you can just well, turf then, him. Then and I think get you make else. him number seven, and you bring Shillington into six. Exactly. Pending Shillington yeah. doesn't get. I can and we can talk more about the Seattle expansion draft as we get closer. But I don't know if they're going to want to touch Geo's money. I can see them taking Shillington. Well, I think that uh, they're going to want a captain for their team and some buzz and getting a, f- a guy who's two years removed from a Norris Trophy who's like the leadership guy in the NHL. Yeah, I just currently. don't know if he's going to be the, the sales pitch you need in Seattle. Yeah, it's one of those. Uh, plus, he's known in the area-ish because Calgary is relatively close to Seattle. Like, if you're a hockey fan from Seattle you will know Mark Giordano. And so... I just don't know, and we'll talk... Yeah, I mean, we can talk about this in the future too, but I said to you, you know, when we were looking at the Vegas um, expansion draft, you need to take a guy you can put on a marquee to sell tickets, and I think they got that with Flurry. Flurry was the guy who they could put on the banner and say, come buy a ticket. I don't know that Giordano sells you a ticket. I, I think he does, because Norris Trophy... A you know, couple literally. years ago, now 37. Yeah, well, still. He, he, I would expect him to be the captain. His uh, deal's expiring next year, so he was a tradable asset. The, you know, like, for, if I'm Seattle looking at it from their point of view, like, the two main guys that Calgary would have are Shillington and Giordano. Shillington might get you a third-round pick, you know, in terms of value out of it, where Giordano, at the trade deadline you're likely getting a first and a prospect. Yeah, so, I don't know that they're looking at it that way, though, to bring him in and trade him. I think... Th- no, I know. And, and, the, and I think you're right. It depends. Are you looking for a guy for one year to be your captain or two years, or are you looking for a guy that, while he might get you a third-round pick, could probably be part of your core for three, four years? Yeah, and that will be, like, how Ron Francis... And I think we have to look at how many team. other... And we don't know yet, but how many other Mark Giordano-type veterans are available that might be cheaper and get you your you know your c yeah and um, that's where it's gonna be a, an interesting thing uh, it's just yeah i i, I still think, think the that, flames might lose Derek ryan like we talked about because he's the hometown boy yeah if i would w- if i was gonna bring in a veteran just to wear my c there i'd probably see and i bet he'll be exposed i'd probably bring in Ocposo out of buffalo if he's exposed yeah just i can to, see that just because i think fans especially casual fans know the forwards better than they know defensemen, I think. You don't even know what a Norris trophy is if you're not a diehard NHL fan. But I think you can show some better highlight reel pieces of Ocposo on local TV and say, come buy your tickets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's used to playing for crap teams. Yeah, exactly. So I, I just I think he'll be available, and he's the kind of guy who I could see going over there and being that, you know, one of the, the older faces on that team. Yeah. Definitely possible. Um, and then we got to, and, and we need to leave some money as well for goaltending. I don't think they promote from within. I think you got to go out and buy a veteran. Oh, I don't think you have to. I think they will go out and buy a veteran for a year. Yeah, I think, and that's like a million dollar guy. Do you keep Domingue you know? or do you bring in somebody else? Uh, basically, like you said before the show, it's like, here's our number to all the agents of, you know, UFA goalies. Mm-hmm. Anybody want it? You got a spot. 
And you'll, I have a you'll feeling play we'll, games I have and, a feeling yeah. we'll end up with a guy like a Kelvin Picard who's been around the league forever but been a career backup. Yeah. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Yeah, it's, uh, like a, it, up until like this season, I would have said a guy like a Jack Campbell or, you know, like that generic kind of, and, you know, insert adequate, decent backup, but not expensive. And to me, there's two ways to go with that. You bring in a younger guy like a Picard in his 20s, if you're looking at this being more than one year, or you go with the Talbot route, or what I'd say the Aaron Dell route, where the guy in the 33, you know, 32, 33 year old bracket, I think, uh, you know, Dell be going into his 34 year old season next year where he's good enough for a year and we'll figure it out or promote after that. Yeah. And see how things go. Like, it, honestly, um, well, yeah, like, I think that I'd probably go slightly on the younger side, just, uh, you know, if you have a choice, but I think like priority think number one Younger goalies is, are going to want more than one year, and they can probably get it too. Yeah, and realistically, the main feature is $1 million. Uh, here, take it or leave it. Go away. If, <laughs> if Domingue would take it, do you bring Louis Domingue back? Sure, but uh, honestly, that's a league minimum. And do you feel in. that you need to go out and get a goalie, or do you feel like uh, Zaga Doolin or Parsons would be adequate in the job? I would be skeptical if uh, that those were the options. It, it would probably be okay. See, here's the thing, though. Don't... With our previous goaltending, I would have said no. But if if Markstrom is a legitimate 60-goal guy, or 60-game guy, I should say, you should kind of be able to run one of those guys as an adequate enough backup. You should, but... And like, neither I think you, of them you need to find a guy at the who's... level, and that's the problem. Like, if they were having a decent season in Stockton, well, Calgary, um, that you would uh, see one of them get promoted. But both of them have just been adequate at the AHL level. They haven't really taken the ball and run with it. I think what you might do is sign a guy like Deming or Picard or Dell or someone at you know eight hundred thousand that you're willing to demote and tell one of those guys earn your way up. We'll waive this guy. We don't care if we lose him if you can earn your way into that job. Exactly. But at oh, least, no. but and at you least leave that option. But at least then yeah. you've got the the support. Mm-hmm. No, because you don't want to go. Oh crap! <laughs> now we need who's a goalie available of- October first. Yeah, it's like, oh, we're like a month into the season and we're calling 31 other teams and because we need a freaking goalie right effing now. <laughs> where's, where's Brent Cron these days? Hey, Fred Brathwaite was suited up the other day, so... Andre Trefloff. Well, now that, now that we've got, what, um, we now that we've got Siglet not as our top goalie guy anymore, maybe you bring Siglet back at that point. Yeah, well, LaBarbera could do it, so... LaBarber's you know. in charge of goaltending, but yeah, Siglitz is underly now, so you never know. Yep. Or no, I think it's the other way around. Yeah, Siglitz yeah, the right. head guy, and yeah, LaBarber's the day The goalie guy. coach, yeah. Well, yeah, no, I think you're right. We we need to find somebody there, but I think that'll be the last... It, I don't want to say the last Lisa, priority, but it's the yeah. least money we throw at any problem this season. Yeah, like I, I wouldn't actually be shocked if that was one of the first signings by the Flames come july 1st just by them saying here's you know to you 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 and you we got a million bucks it's got your name on it if you want it you don't okay and i think that somebody will sign relatively fast just because hey you don't want to be in august and oh crap i need a job and i'm going to europe now (laughs) well and you and i've talked about this though there will be two more nhl jobs and two more ahl jobs open because of this so i don't think some of those guys might go to europe but i think that this is also the piece that you may see the flames not address and bring up within if you know they're to me if they blow all their money on other positions i think you just say well we'll bring parsons up good enough yeah that could be doable Honestly, I think at that rate you might see like a team that has like three ish goalies, like say like a good prospect, a uh, so so guy, and like a third guy that they might want to bring in as a backup. 
snagging that second guy. <laughs> well, and, it, and at that point, Matt, I'd wait till beginning of the season waivers. There's always that day that we end the season when everybody there's some goalie on there who gets dumped on waivers. And you go, oh, he's good enough. Like you know, plan to run the season with Parsons or Zagadulin, and then wait and make a waiver claim. Now you see what you do is you go to Columbus because they have Corpusalo and Merlitskins. Who's their number third three? Yeah, we'll take you. <laughs> you know, yeah, they, I, they actually do have a third good goalie prospect. They just can't remember but, it because it. But yeah, see, in that case, Corpus really Allo's getting names. old. They'll probably want to hang on to the goalie prospect as their next guy. Yeah, but you know, I can see. Let's just say a team like Montreal, right? Who had like Price, um, Allen, and Lindgren, and they put Lindgren on waivers. You might just say, okay, we'll grab Lindgren. Good enough. Yeah. And by the way, a trade that does need to happen, Elvis Merlitskins has to go to the Vegas Golden Knights at some point. It just has to happen. I was thinking does, I was thinking that Elvis should go to Nashville. Well, that that would be a good number two, but, you know, because Vegas, yeah, it, it's just, that's the second best fit. You don't want, you don't want Elvis closer to Graceland? Well, he did perform a lot in Vegas, so, you know, it's one, it, you know, either is a good idea, but, you know, Vegas, they, they kind of have older goaltending, so it makes a little more sense. But you're, you're just, you're just writing the headline for the Columbus uh, beat writers. Elvis has left the city yeah. or Elvis has left the building. One of the two. Yeah. Well, well, I do find it amusing that he got his first career shutout in Vegas, and the coach for Vegas, I think, said that, like, I'm glad that Elvis has left the building. So, yeah. It, it's the easy way to go, and coaches aren't known to be the most media-friendly. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's wrap up the week by looking ahead. We've got two games this week on the docket, only two of them, um, and both against the same team. We have one on Thursday night at 7 p.m. start time and one on Saturday night at 8 p.m. start time against our rivals to the north, both of them up north. Quick uh, quick road trip up to Edmonton before we come back for three. So, Matt, we got a nice break this week. Good time for the Flames to recenter themselves. Two games against Edmonton. How do you think they do? There is no other option. They need four points. It doesn't matter if Edmonton gets loser points in overtime. They just need four points. So that's what I'm going to run with. I think they'll get two or zero. Uh, actually, I'd be more likely to think that they'll get zero and just, yeah, after today. And well, we're that, done. Last week but, I predicted a loss and then two wins. So we actually have four games in there. We won't count today's, but I would have ended up winning last week. Yeah. Um, so that puts me now at uh, five nothing against you this season. Yeah, well, I'll make it up during the playoffs. <laughs> you you can yeah. start predicting guys' handicaps on the golf course. Yep. Um, I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with two points this week. I think they get a they'll win the first one and lose the second one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, to me, I'm expecting zero points, and but they need four. So I'll go with four, but I'm expecting zero. Our last couple games against Edmonton, we split on the 2nd of April. We had a 3-2 loss to them. And then on the 10th at home, big 5 nothing win. So I think that we'll split these uh, next two and, and final two games against the Oilers as well. Uh -huh. Well, you see, uh, the thing is, is that strategically, it would be better for Edmonton to lose the games to Calgary and be kind of rooting for the Flames to make the playoffs. The reason being is that Montreal or Vancouver is going to get spanked by Toronto. And, you know, like a five-game series at most. Where Calgary might actually give them a hard time. And Edmonton, you know, like, I, just as a logistics thing, you know, you're going to want Toronto as beat up as possible. And, like, Montreal's not going to be hitting Toronto much. Vancouver's not going to hit Toronto much. But Calgary will be hitting them regularly. So, you know, if I was playing strategically, I would be wanting Calgary to win that playoff spot. So, you might dial off the gas a bit if you're the Oilers. Nobody just... looks at it that way, Matt, because you love the gas and something happens and then you're out or someone overtakes you. Yeah. Right, it, you you talked about professionalism earlier today, right? Professionalism—you yeah, well, don't die off the gas. And it's and, Edmonton. 
Yeah, but Edmonton, <laughs> as much as we say that, Edmonton's above us right now. Yeah. Well, yeah, because they have one good player. <laughs> Whatever it is, they're above us. Yeah. I think if well, I was Edmonton at this point, I'd be starting to, based on what we've seen with the last couple of Flames games, I think I might be playing McDavid not as much. That's and preserving what I'm meaning. Him. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. I don't like, think you necessarily dial off the gas, but I think you well, might. Well, that's what I mean. Like, because McDavid is the Edmonton Oilers. I, that's what I'm meaning. Like, play him like 15 minutes instead of 30. Uh, yeah. So that way, you know. Like, the big question not... is who do you put in net? Because Mike Smith has looked stellar against us this year. And even if you yeah. dial back on McDavid, if, uh, if Smitty's in net, unless we get another goalie fight, I, I think that they could take the games just right there. Yeah. For some reason, that man's looked good. He didn't look great in Calgary, but everywhere else he looks good. Yeah. Well, it, it, Smith has always looked good when he's getting shelled. So, you know, and when you're yeah, in you Edmonton, in it, it, it's the perfect mix, you know. Like, Edmonton doesn't play defense. And, you know, you have a goalie who responds well to that. So, yeah. it's a perfect fit. You're right. So what Calgary needs to do is get, like, seven shots in the game, and they'll score five goals. <laughs> we'll see how it goes, Matt. That's uh, We got those two games against Edmonton this week, and then next week you and I only have one game to talk about, which is the Winnipeg game. But um, we'll deal with that when we get there. We got to get through this series against Edmonton first to even keep any sort of playoff hope alive. You said 6-1-1, one, one, so we got to win at least one of these to keep a 6-1-1 one, one record doable. Yeah. Well frankly like if we're we don't get through this week two and oh then like we can start talking about like draft position and all that kind which of hl guys do you want to see in the lineup yeah exactly like the real like nuts and bolts of like dissecting this team i want to do some research this week i know we can call up from stockton because they're here what does it take for stockton to call up from kansas at this point yeah, I think that there's just, like, floating random guys that are just attached to teams now that are in the bubble that, you know. Guys who, hey, Matt Stajan, get out of the broadcast booth. Come down here. We need a we need a healthy body. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, hey, assistant coach guy who used to play a long time ago. You're good. Where's Poplinski? <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, yeah. You, have, you have skates and a stick. <laughs> How many alumni guys still in town? Where's Glenn Cross? Yep. Hey, Jelena, back on the ice. AHL team, let's go. Yep. Connie's Connie's <laughs> here. He's healthy. How yep. many How many unemployed Sutter brothers do we have? <laughs> There's some bodies we can sign. Yeah, just you know, go to the farm, grab everybody that's uh, you know of age, male, and there you go. <laughs> there you go. That fills our bodies. Yep. Got half a team right there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what right. positions? Who cares? Like, just go do your thing. <laughs> and we're far enough into the season, it doesn't matter what position. Just rove around and fill a body. <clears throat> yep. If there's somebody near you, hit them. Woo. <laughs> well, Matt, I think it's time to get out of here. Let's enjoy these uh, Oilers games this week. And if we're all the Dome, I think we'd, we'd hear a loud crowd in the Dome this week, but we're not. So... Why don't you give us the the chant that we'd be hearing if we were all there? Well, as always, go Flames, go. And kick those Oilers butts. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.